Okay. It dimmed. Suggesting it detected something at least, right? Is it streaming now? Can you check? Somebody check? <laughs> at least, even if we don't have the mix, at least we have the slides. Det är inte inte. Den är uppe? Okej. Okej. But mix doesn't work. No. Okay, I guess we can, we can do it this way. It's all right. We get the slides at least and I get my, uh, my voice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, what if I do a mix now? Yeah. All right. I think we're I think we're fine now. Because uh, I'm there too. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's continue. So so we did the roles in Scrum, the the uh, the Scrum master, the team, and the uh, the product owner. And we had the ceremonies, the planning, the review, the retrospective, and uh, the daily Scrum. And now we're going to go through the three artifacts that, be, that will be created throughout this process. So the product backlog. The product lack backlog is a list of all user stories, a uh, list of all features expressed in such a way that each item has a value to the end user or the customer. And it's prior prior prioritized, as I said, between every sprint by the product owner and reprioritized, yes. Uh, so here's, a, here's an example of, of, of poor user stories, but still, this is a backlog, product backlog, and this is some uh, hotel reservation system. So as a guest, I want to make a reservation. Poor user story, but still. As a guest, I want to cancel a reservation. As a guest, I want to change the date of a reservation, etc., etc. And And the story points here, how many are familiar with story points? Yes, some. Uh, these these kind of represent ballpark effort, right? So, if this has five story points and this has three story points, that that means that the team thinks that, based on their current knowledge of what this means, that user story, that this one is about would take about twice as much effort as that one. That's what that says. Or these two together would take about the same amount of effort as, as pulling off that one. That's what these means. And we will get to where those numbers come from. Uh, yeah, another one. So, forget about that one. Uh, so, so the sprint, this and the, spr the sprint backlog, right? The sprint log backlog is the tasks that result from the user stories. Right. And so the sprint backlog is a long list of tasks. It can be organized different ways, obviously. Uh, and individuals on the team sign up for these tasks. Say, you know, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, I'll take that one. And you're not signing up for a task that you're, you don't think you're going to be able to do. Right. And you're not signing up for a task that you know that somebody else on the team would easily do in half an hour, it might take you two days to do it, right? So, so your goal is on the team delivering something, right? So you're smart about how you use your time. And work is never, ever assigned. So you, 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 you say what you want to do. Uh, and if you remember, these, you, these, these, these tasks are estimated in hours. Right? And you might pick one of these tasks and start to work on it, 
And then say that this task is set two hours. It was estimated to take two hours. You start to work on this task, you spend four hours. And in your estimate, there's still a couple of hours left. Right? It doesn't matter how much time you have spent. The only thing that matters is how much time do you think is left? Doesn't matter how much you put in, it's only about getting to the goal. Right? And we see how that is important later on. So at any point in time, any task that is in the system, the our estimate of that task, the number of hours remaining on that task, is to the best of your understanding right now. It could change tomorrow when you get a better understanding. It's again humble, right? We don't know for sure. This is my best estimate right now. Uh, any team member can modify the sprint backlog, the tasks that need to be done, because it might be that the case that when you did, since everything is time boxed, so in this planning meeting, when you thought of that, well, this user story, we can do that if we do these five technical tasks. And then you realize once you start to work on it that ah, there's another thing we need to do as well, right? We miss that initially, and that's okay because we were time boxed. But now that we know that this needs to be done, we add it, right? So it reflects reality to the best of your understanding at any point in time. Uh, Yeah, so the sprint backlog reflects reality as the team understands it at any point in time. So here we have an example of a, of a, of a simple sprint backlog. So these are the initial hour estimates, these five tasks. After one day, the estimated hours has gone down for two of the tasks has gone up for one. We thought it was going to take hours, take eight hours. The developer might already have put in ha already have put in ten hours, but thinks that it's sixteen hours left. Those ten hours are never seen. So nobody sees how much time you have spent, only what you deliver. Right? Focus on delivering value. Right? Not tracking people. That's not what we're doing at all. Uh, After another day, you see, now the task for coding the UI has actually gone up. Right? It's not ideal, right? And the better, the better the team is, the more of these problems you're going to encounter, the, the fewer of these problems you're going to encounter because you get be better and better at, at estimating. But it's OK to be wrong. And here, you see, here, a new, a new task actually came up because we had forgotten that we needed to deal with error logging. Right? And that's OK, as long as it's there. Yeah, get it. Now, uh, this is a burn down chart. So in the beginning, so here we have a, a sprint. Here we have like a four week long sprint from 421 to, f to 524. And so the team estimated initially that if you summed up the hours for all the tasks, that they had something like 775 hours to do, work, oh, amount of work to do. Now, after a day, it has gone up. Assuming the team actually did some work during that day, still they've discovered new things. So they realized some things were, were more difficult than they anticipated. And the third day it goes up again. I mean, this is bad news, right? I mean, ideally, it's pretty clear what we want here, right? It's a, it's a straight line from there to zero <coughs> at the end of the iteration, right? That's, that's the ideal scenario, a straight line there. Has never happened, right? And as a matter of fact, if it happens, then chances are you spend too much time analyzing and sizing things, more time than necessary. 
you probably could have done put that time to better use right because it's not important to be exact here at all but you can see here after like two and a half weeks there was a sudden drop here right and who knows what what you can attribute that to but it could be that the team actually dropped one user story right so all the tasks associated with that user story were removed from the sprint backlog could have been the case right or somebody come came up with a fantastic idea or found a third party package or something to solve some problem that you thought you had to solve yourself and we realized that you know this was we actually expected this to take you know a hundred hours and it turns out that we did it in three hours by finding a package somewhere to did the work for us don't really know but the but as, as you can probably tell right by looking at this I mean if you are up here at this stage a few days before you end there's no way you're gonna end right so you use this to kind of to manage yourself and the product manager product owner is also looking at this to see to see uh, you know maybe we need to drop something because it's it you get zero credit for developing for almost finishing all the stories zero nothing the only thing you get credit for that counts is is working functionality so accepted and use story that's been accepted when it's been presented to to the product owner right. so so probably what happened here was that the team dropped one of the user stories. And the team cannot do that without conversation with the, with, the, with the product owner, right? But if you tell the product owner that, you know, if you don't drop any user story, you're not going to get anything. Nothing is going to be finished at the end of this sprint. However, if we drop, drop one user story, you will get at least two or three, two out of three of the, of the, of the, of the user stories that you, that, that you want us to do. So it's used as a, a kind of a management tool. So an example of this, oh yeah, it's kind of slow animation. It could be something like that. So you'll stare at these at these burn down charts during during the uh, the project. Uh, well, we went through that. Uh, the last part here is very important to, 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 to stress, that so the team commits to what they can do, starting with the product backlog and understanding, prioritize product backlog and understanding of, of what it means, what those stories actually mean. The team says, we're going to take this one and this one and that one. That's what we're going to do in this print. We're going to do number one, number two, and number four. We cannot do none two three because three is too big, so we can take in number four, use story number four instead, and that's what we're going to do in this sprint. And so, no work is assigned by management. Now, if you want to scale this, well, typically you know you have one team of five to nine people, and uh, the natural way of scaling it is to kind of to have some form of scrum of scrums, right? That you have you have smaller teams where you pick representatives from these teams. And they don't meet every day, but they might meet twice during every second day or every third day. Because you can also in regular applications there are regular systems, there are dependencies between things is not so nice so that you, you can completely div divide up the functionality and different teams work in isolation from each other. There are dependencies between them and those dependencies typically it's better to use people to, to keep an eye on those dependencies. And then of course you can scale that up, right? In this way. Of course assume when you add layers, right? Complexity is, is added. Uh, so just a little bit of a story. So, so my, my, my implementation of Scrum was with when I was still at DoubleClick. Uh, and 
we were doing it because we changed the way we developed software because projects were constantly running late and delivered with reduced functionality. Constantly. There was tension between different departments. The product folks always felt that the engineering didn't perform. Always this tension between, you should be able to do this as well, this as well, this as well. Right? And, and we had no metrics for how we were performing as an organization, as an engineering organization. My, I was, I was a, at a meeting with my boss, with our owners, and I asked my boss, who was the CIO of this company, they asked him, so how's the organization doing? I said, you know, smile, said, you know, it's doing pretty well. And then the, the, the money guy says, how do you know? How do you know if your organization of 300 people are, are doing well relative to kind of their capacity. How do you know? Right? What do you compare with? Like, another company? Or what, what, do you, what do you compare? We have nothing to compare to. So you don't really know if you're doing well or you're doing a shitty job. No idea. Right? I mean, if the business is doing well, yeah, they're probably not going to complain about you, but they might not be doing well because you're doing well. <laughs> they might do well despite how you're performing. Don't know. Uh, uh, and the challenges here, yeah, incomplete requirements, for engineers, uh, production ready code monthly requires good development practices. Uh, and agile product development affects all other organizational functions. Because typically, you know what happens is, is product folks. Uh, for, 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 for a next release, a next big release of a system, whatever it is, right? They decide what's going to be in this release. They decide when it's going to be released. They're checking in with the engineering organization so that they, 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 they or the engineering organization that doesn't, doesn't say a, a blank no to it. But, and then they're communicating that to the marketing folks that you know, in November, November 15, we're gonna we have a new release, and these are the features in this release. Now, you marketers, now go sell it, right? Go market the shit out of this, and so the sales folk pe people can sell this new release. Uh, problem is, that thing never gets released. What, what, what they promise never gets released. And if you're moving to a, a, an agile way of doing things, then you don't really know exactly what will be released when. Well, try telling that to the marketing folks. Right? Well, then what am I going to market? How am I going to communicate if you don't know what it is or not even exactly when? Right? So, so if, the, if the engineering organization switches to another way of building product, uh, it trickles out. In th that it affects every other function in the organization. Uh, the results of this implementation was huge improvement in visibility and adaptability for the product folks. They were very happy with that. And there were huge gains in, 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 in predictability as to when we were going to be able to deliver this. And you'll see that in a little bit, how that is possible. Uh, this is probably a year old, uh, but still more or less ac accurate. So Agile today, 56%. Uh, and then if you add the hybrid thing is, uh, Scrum is a de facto standard for, for, for software development these days. Right? I mean, there are, there are alternatives, fl flavors of it. But it, it's a it's, 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 it's leading one. Uh, when they ask people what are the top three benefits, they say ability to ch manage changing priorities, increase team productivity, and improve project visibility. What are the top techniques used? Daily stand-up, iteration planning, retrospectives, iteration review, and short iterations. So uh, it's really, Agile is a disruptive social technology. It fundamentally changes how any organi organization pursues its mission. Right? It, it, it's, it's a new way 
of organizing a group of people to accomplish something. Right? It didn't exist before. So that sounds great, right? So you could just move to an agile methodology. Well, you know, it's not that easy, unfortunately. This is, this is very easy in, 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 in theory, but very difficult in, in, in practice. And very often because of this, right? That we, we, we've always done it this way. You know, it, it we know how to do it this way. It works doing it this way. Uh, some pitfalls when, uh, when implementing Agile. Uh, micromanaging needs to go away because you no longer have a manager who tells you what to do. Because remember, the teams are self-organizing. Manager has no say in what and who exactly does what. It's the team that decides, right? And this is this is not comfortable for because that's for many managers. That's what manager means. I know better what you should be doing, so I'm telling you what you should be doing. Uh, and if you think about it that way, uh, because we're so used in our culture to these hierarchical organizations, and the hierarchical organizations, they actually. They actually came from the from the railroads when they built the railroads in the U.S. So they built these hierarchies, right? These org organizations on top, and the reason for that was that the people who were actually laying the railroads, they had no, at least trained cognitive abilities. They were used because of their physical abilities, right? So they needed somebody to tell them which direction the rail was going to go. They didn't know. Th this is not what they were doing. They were just muscles for hire. Right? Well, think about that today. The people who are doing the work today are people like you, like highly, quali highly qualified cognitive workers. People like us don't, re don't respond very well to this command and control kind of management that is built in to the hierarchical <coughs> management organization. So, so that model doesn't work anymore. We need to figure out another model to organize a group of people to accomplish something together. And it's not that easy. Uh, so micromanaging is a problem. Uh, individual rewards is a problem, like compensation. Right? How do you compensate? Typically, at least in the U.S., you know, salaries vary dramatically between team members. Right? But now you have a model here where it's the team that you should uh, reward if they do well. Right? So you need to figure out another way of, 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 of compensating your, your employees. Uh, this is transparency. Transparency is, is not always welcome, and especially by the people at the top of the organization. They, they all feel like imposters, right? The higher up you go in an organization, the more insecurity you get. Insecurity in, in that, are they really cut for the position they have in the organization? There's something called, actually, they call the, the, the Peter Principle, I think it is, and that says that, that in an organization, you rise to a level where you're incompetent and then you spend the rest of your time trying to protect your position where you're incompetent, <coughs> rather than focusing on, 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 the, on the goal of the organization you're part of somehow. And, and you know, that's related to how, how closely tied your status in, in the professional realm is to your feeling about, you, about your self-esteem in society. Right? It's very important that you know, I'm at that level in that organization now, I and that affects who I am outside of my work as well, right? So it's, it's just human nature to, to pr protect that. But it's difficult. Uh, this is kind of standing and falling with the team. Most people are not used to that. Right? You're not alone anymore. Uh, this says we are different. Yeah, you know, Every organization I've spoken to, when they first, when I first presented with these ideas, they said, "Yeah, you know, sounds good, but we do things a little bit differently here." Right? So.
so so you know we'll look at this and maybe we get some use some of this as input to 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 modify the way we do things here but then I'll go back now to the to the lasagna example right well don't modify it before you tried it <laughs> give it a shot first right and if you're going to do this don't start from where you are and try to shed things jump all the way over to the other side and if there's something you need to bring back from from how you used to do things that worked worked really well well then bring it in but don't start from the wrong end kind of right because you tend to get stuck there uh, you s you've seen that right the uh, the uh, uh, the swing and the uh, and that has to do with with uh, incomplete requirements uh, getting requirements from the customer actually getting it right you can't imagine how difficult it is if 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 I'm a consulting company and somebody comes to me and and, and, and wants to buy something from me and and I, if I tell them that you know when I'm halfway through this I want to show it to you and get your feedback to make sure that you actually get something that you you feel is valuable for the money that you're gonna pay me right they don't want to know about it they want to go they want you to go away until you deliver the finished product to them something that they don't even know what it is at the time when they order it order it from you uh, Lacking definition of done. Uh, this is a this is a tricky one. Like as, as a user story. If you have a user story, how how do you know that it's done? Like how what does it mean that it's done? Is it it's like 100% test coverage? Uh, do all uh, uh, border cases uh, everything does everything have to be done, or is it okay if it's not everything is done? So how do you crisply clearly define what done means. Uh, kind of lack of future vision. Uh, I mean, the product owner doesn't know what the team is going to deliver, so how do they know where they're going to get? The team doesn't know what's going to happen in the product later on. They're used to having a pretty clear picture of the end goal and then march in that direction. Now they're getting a clear picture of next week's goal. And so they might be a bit flustered because they feel that, that knowing, thinking that they know what's going to happen in the future is going to make them feel more in control now somehow. But you know, there's no such thing. You know, really what, what oh, I got to tell you this one. Uh, what's going on? Somebody, somebody told me, I went to a conference and somebody told me, you know, we're really just, we're just a, a kind of dense stardust hanging on to a roaring a planet that's uh, hanging on to a rock that is roaring through space. Right? That's what we are. But it's even worse than that. Uh, and it's kind of in relation to control, being in control. Now, you know, if the pop, the, 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 the if you take Earth and compress it to to a black hole, in effect, to maximum density, which means you eliminate the distances between all particles. Eliminate all those distances. Do you know how big the black hole would be? About the size of a pea. Right? OK. We have about the same density as Earth. About. It might be a factor of two or something, but about the same density as Earth, right? So what each one of us is, is a constellation, a, an extremely sparse constellation of particles. Extremely parse, sparse. There's almost the, 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 the distance between the particles is enormous compared to the size of the particles. OK, now, so we are a loose cons low structure of particles. right? On top of that, every single particle in your body is replaced at least every seven years. Most of them are replaced within weeks. Right? So, uh, well, you clearly you are not the particles. 
because they're replaced. It's not a single particle in you that was there seven years ago, but it's still you, right? Still you somehow. So somehow you are that structure. I think of that as like a, a populated data structure. Right? We, we're kind of a populated data, data structure where the data gets replaced all the time. But, but, but what I was going to get to was, was so with this loose, loose, loose structure of particles, and by the way, you know, we are exchanging particles here all the time, right? You and I are exchanging particles. I have a lot of your particles, and you have a lot of mine. There's no way around that, right? Uh, now, so this loose structure of particles uh, being held to Earth through gravity, Right? Earth is moving at, I think, 4,000 kilometers an hour, spinning. Right? We are spinning around the sun, and here we are trying to stay in control. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I mean, there is no such thing. <laughs> it's really pathetic. Right? But but you know we do it because it has it has uh, it has served us is in, in 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 kind of evolutionary right because it has it has made a, it has increased the ability of us surviving for example right? trying to stay control things around us uh, it's a disease uh, yes don't do it unless you have to I right? mean do it when you have to but when you don't have to don't. That's the problem, that we're not good at being selective about these abilities that we have. No? Uh, the last one here, the last uh, Agile pitfall, has to do with, 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 a, with a, a product owner not doing their job, really. You know, this, they, they don't, might not have enough time, they might not be good at what they're doing, and as they say, you know, shit in, shit out. Right? If they're not providing you with a prioritized backlog and understand what what the market needs, it doesn't matter what you do, right? So it might fail anyway. It doesn't matter if you have, your engineering organization is like a humming machine, right? A well-greased humming machine. Anything you throw at it, it just delivers out like that. But if you're not throwing good stuff at it, good stuff is not going to be delivered. Uh, yeah, and this is a little bit about that, uh, that it's the bigger challenge. Uh, and this is, this is more what I'm dealing with, kind of, if anything, these days. Kind of organizational problems related to, because you have an agile organization. Here is I IT, right, development. We're agile. We are, every two weeks, we're delivering stuff. Well, uh, here is operations. And they say, we release according to our own schedule, right? three times a year or something like that. Well, then it doesn't matter that the, the organ engineering organization is agile. Uh, uh, HR says, we need well-defined, legally defensible annual performance assessments. Well, this, this, is, this is not what this is about at all, right? Legal says, we need contracts. Uh, you know, this, the way we work now, build software, doesn't really work with with contract, it's rather it's a collaboration rather than a contract, because we need we realize in order to do things this way, and this is the only way that we know how to do things well, requires that we collaborate, not that we write contracts with our customers. Okay, and then the last one. I would just I would just go through this. It's not going to take more than an hour, maybe forty-five minutes an hour. Uh, so now we're going to go into s user stories, story points, and planning, which is kind of the gist of of, uh, of 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 Scrum to some extent. So there's really five levels of planning that we're doing. We're going to look into those. We're going to talk about user stories and acceptance criteria story points, team velocity, and estimation. And planning, this is nothing, nothing surprising here, that there are different levels of planning. 
you might have a product vision that might be done even a annually only by, by the product owner. Where's, where's this going? Uh, you might have some form of roadmap for the, for, the, for the coming year or the coming six months. Uh, you might have some form of a release plan for the next release. It's like quarterly, something like that. Uh, and then you're coming down to the next plannings. And the next, is the one, next one is, is the sprint, sprint planning, the iteration planning. And then you have the daily stand-up, which is also a, a planning meeting in a way, because you're telling people what you're going to do and what you need. Uh, yes, yeah, so it goes from strategic to, to, to tactical. Uh, in the vision, you're asking the big question, right? What are you trying to accomplish? And wha why is this good for the business? Uh, product roadmap, you have some high-level themes. It might be that, yeah, whatever it is. There's a lot of wiggle room there. Uh, release plan, uh, well, then you're getting into more serious stuff. You need to be able to understand have some idea what you're able to achieve, not just what you what you wish wish to achieve. Uh, balance load between teams, and then iteration plan. We already went through that. And here is uh, this is the same the same one as before. Should I go through it again, or do you do you have some? It's good enough. All right. So, so the product backlog. Uh, so as I said, it's been it's prioritized, and uh, the higher priority an item is, the higher priority a, a use a s feature is, a user story on the product backlog, the more fine grained it needs to be, because these the top stories here, th this is what the team looks like looks looks at at the, at the sprint planning, so they need to be very well understood by the product manager. They cannot be, be, be uh, uh, yeah, too abstract. Uh, after that, you might have larger user stories, which is OK, since they're not going to be picked anyway. Right? These are the ones that the team is picking, it from, picking from. You know, as a product owner, that there's no way in the next sprint that they will be able to do more than, than what is fine-grained right now. No way at all. So you can wait with 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 a kind of defining, further defining the larger user stories and break them down into smaller ones. And at the at the end, at the bottom of this, you might have big user stories, also known as epics, like really big stuff. So why user stories? Well, requirements is a communication problem. So, so somebody wants something done, and you need to communicate that in a, in a way so it's understood what needs to be done. And uh, you know, here's this one again, right? Which is just a type exa example of, of of why this this is this is problematic. Right? Uh, so any user story. So a user story is a simple, brief description of functionality told from the perspective of a user or a customer. And they all have this format. As who I want bought, so that why. Use cases is something entirely different. Use case describes the interaction between a system and agents of that system, right, or actors on that system. Uh, so it has a goal. As a user, as preconditions, he has a standard path, alternative path, edge cases, and then post conditions. Now, if we compare those two user stories and use cases, so user stories uh, are about needs, and use cases are about behavior of a system. The user stories are faster to produce and can be written by product folks. Th th this is a very important one because, you know. Back in the day when, when, when everybody was using use cases, uh, we needed to educate the product people to write use cases. And it's, it's not a natural language. For, for us, it might be pretty natural, because we might put ourselves in the, from the perspective of the system. Right? And OK, what are these guys going to do to me? Right? But, but the product manager 
they're thinking on behalf of their users. They're not thinking on behalf of the system. So in order for them to express something that, that actually conveys what they mean, user story is a much better way. Uh, user stories can be used for planning and estimation. Uh, they're not a sequence of actions. They contain acceptance criteria. Uh, we'll, we'll look into those. Uh, are not meant to document every aspect of work. They're not meant to be complete. So just like things are time boxed, which means that they're not perfect, or the output what you produce is not perfect, uh, these are not supposed to be perfect. It's OK. And they should be able to be coded and tested in one sprint. I used this story. And so good user stories, there are independent, so as few de dependencies as possible. Negotiable, so details can be added to, uh, to it via, negoti by, via collaboration with the product owner. Uh, they're valuable, so provide some value to the customer. Uh, you can estimate them. They're small enough, and they're testable, meaning that you have acceptance criteria, so you know when, when the story is done, if it passes these criteria. So some good user stories. Uh, so this is from a video sharing site. So it says, as a creator, I want to upload a video from my local machine so that any user can view it. As a, as a, as who, I want what, so that why. Second one, as a user, I want to search by keyword to find videos that are relevant to me. Right? Perfectly OK user stories. But as you can see, they're not complete, right? Y there's no way you know what to build by looking at this user story. Right? You know, OK, what, 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 what video formats? I mean, how are you going to know if this is done if you don't know what formats are going to be supported, for example, right? But that's, that doesn't belong in the user story. And we get to that. So it's like three Cs, the card, the conversation, the confirmation. The card is the actual story. Right? Simple, could be written on an index card or something. Right? Simple story. Uh, conversation is the conversation that happens between the team and the product owner. When the team is asking the product owner, OK, so you want to upload video, have you thought of which formats we should support? And so the product owner might ask the team, well, you know, you guys, you are the ones dealing with video. What, which formats do you think we should support? What are the reasonable set of formats we should support here? So it's not only the product owner that is telling the team. The product owner, a, a decent product owner, also solicits input from the team. Because the team, team can somewhat, sometimes the team knows some things better, you know, than the product owner. Uh, and confirmation acceptance criteria. So this helps determine when it's when it's when it's when it's completed. Uh, and acceptance criteria are also expressed in simple language. Right? There's no formal test cases or anything that, like this. No no formalism at all. And we'll see examples of these. So okay, so here the card said, as a creator, I want to upload a video from my local machine so that any user can view it. And now from the conversation between the team and the product owner, uh, it's concluded that there should be an upload button present on every page of the site. It doesn't belong in the story. It's a detail, but it's important. Uh, and videos, there's something about the size of the videos, file formats. And I want to see a progress bar, even though I know it doesn't mean anything at all. But I want to see the progress bar. It gives me some false sense of security. And I love it. Until it's been spinning there for too long. You know, I'm, start, I'm starting to realize you know, I'm, being I'm being bullshitted again. Uh, yeah. Uh, confirmation here for this video uploading. So what you should do, you click the upload button, you specify a file make sure that it's that those extensions are supported uh, you check that you cannot upload other ones you check that you cannot up upload too big or too long movies 
for videos and then you click the upload and you check if the progress bar is displayed in real time. So this information, this confirmation belongs with the story but it, it is not the story itself. You don't want to clutter the story. Right? The, the story is very clear. I want to upload a video so other users can see it. Right? And everybody understands what that means. If you were to express that story in, in, in by talking about, about acceptance criteria, you would, you would often miss the point. Kind of you, you get lost somehow. What, what is the bigger picture what we're trying to do here? Uh, some bad user stories. As a user, I want to be able to manage ads, say it's an ad operation context, so that I can remove expired and erroneous ads. What's wrong with that? As a user, I want to be able to manage ads so I can remove expired and erroneous ads. Well, the problem here is the user. Wh which user? I mean, this system might have the you know, kind of ad management system. You might have the chief financial officer logging in to view some reports, run some financial reports in this system. Or you might have a teenager who you hire to, to do just this. right? So if you don't specify which role the person has who's going to do this, how do you know how to best support that person? Right? You need to know, have some idea of of, of why are they interacting with this system? Like the CFO has very different objectives than 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 the, than the uh, hourly paid teenager. Uh, as a developer, I want to improve error logging. Well, there's no why there, right? Why do you want to improve error logging? Uh, you know, so that to improve the quality of the product, right? So you. you even if you have to, you shoehorn something in there to make sure that you follow this format. As a product owner, I want this product to kick ass. Well, clearly, you have no idea what what the product owner, in the product owner's brilliant mind, what, what makes the product kick ass. You have no idea. Or all the connections to the database must go through a connection pool. Well, that's you could rewrite that as as a developer. I want for all the database connection to to go through a pool so that I don't waste resources, which will save us money because we ne need less hardware, for example. So there's, there's a reason you want to do you you want to do connection pooling or database connection. So write it. Uh, example of acceptance criteria: As a conference attendee, I want to register online so it's fast, and I cut down on paperwork. Perfectly fine user story. So acceptance criteria here that could might come up in a conversation with a product owner. A user should not submit without the mandatory fields. Uh, the information submitted is stored in a database. Uh, credit card payment should be supported. And some acknowledged email should be submitted after the user has actually uh, submitted the form. Another example, as a user of the library catalog, I want advanced search options on the front page so that I can quickly and easily f refine my search. Acceptance criteria, I can limit the search by date or format. Uh, I can limit by publisher attributes, such as title, and I can filter by availability. Now, I don't know how much you've thought of this, but, but I enc encountered this problem many times. Uh, 
to cater to different types of users. You have one system, but still you need to support many types of users. Uh, I mean, the users might have different frequency of, of using the system, like me here, you know. When I use this twice a year, there's no way I'll remember which buttons, because there's three buttons out of four you're going to push for some fancy stuff here. How would I remember that? So I need more help than when it comes to using this system than the average lecturer here in Kalmar. Uh, users level of expertise for the domain, general proficiency with, with computers. Uh, the proficiency with this particular software, like am I a newbie, intermediate, am I a power user? You know, power users, you know, they won't command shortcuts, right? They don't want to point and click to everything, right? They want other things. Oh, I've got to tell you this story. I, uh, uh, I met interesting people in, uh, in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. In particular, I met the, uh, the main guy who built the Apple One and, and, uh, in 81 or whenever it was. And uh, and he's still very active, not in this space, but in, in kind of the consciousness space. He's now only interested in consciousness. Uh, and uh, and when I started to read about what he d what he has done, so he actually invented the menu bar. Can you believe that? It didn't exist before. There were no graphical user interfaces really. He invented that menu bar that you have up there or beside somewhere. He invented the double click. <laughs> you imagine that the impact that this guy has on us every single day. And when he presented it to his manager, what he was doing, his manager said that, well, you know, I need a faster way of doing things. This graphic, this GUI, you know, it doesn't cut it to me. I need a faster way of doing things. So he invented the command shortcuts. So every time you do control, control, control X, control V, he actually did that. You know, it's beautiful to, to meet somebody like that. Uh, and he is he is aware of that he might be somewhat responsible for the uh, for our our usage of these devices these days. So he, he's he's not without guilt. Um, the misuse of these devices. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So, so, so different uses need different things, right? And if you think about it, like Word, for example, has Microsoft Word has done a pretty good that job at that, right? As a, it's pretty easy as a newbie because you know the the most frequently used features are are there. You can see them. Those that are not so frequently used. You need to look for them in order to, to 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 use them. So it speaks both to the at least to the newbie and to the intermediate user. But it's it's not so easy to do that. Uh, so sometimes you create personas. It's pretty good to create personas and and keep them in mind, right? And it might seem silly, right? That you know this guy he smokes hand rolled cigarettes, he enjoys jazz, and he loves his little dog. Right, so so you might ask, okay, how is that relevant? Well, you know, we start to think about it, right? Say that this guy, so he is a advertising operations manager, right? Say that this guy is sitting in front of these one of these systems and he's in the middle of some workflow process. And either he thinks he needs some nicotine right now, or maybe his dog needs to go pee pee, or maybe both, right? So he's in this process, workflow process right now, but he actually needs to he needs to take a break. And he expects that when he comes back, he can continue to do his work, right? Well, if we had s assumed that everybody sits there from the time they start the workflow until they end, then we might expire this guy's session after 10 or 15 minutes, right? Having this in mind, we realize, no, we can't do that, right? Because he might want to go out for a smoke. 
must allow him to go, go out for a smoke, and even if it's not good for him. It's a free country, right? As they say over there. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so story points. Yeah, we're fine. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a, of a product backlog. As an HR manager, I want to publish new vacancies so that I can find candidates. And the estimate for this is 20, so 20 story points, which says nothing in isolation, absolutely nothing. But if we look at the second story, as a job hunter, I, can I want to apply for a job so that I can quickly apply for a job. Okay. Uh, the estimate of that is 40. And this means the team has put this estimate there. And I'll tell you how to get to it. Uh, so what this says, this, this is only relevant together with that one. So this only says that the team thinks that implementing this story is about twice as much effort for the team as implementing the first story. So how do you get them? Uh, Assume that you are an iteration into your process. You find a medium-sized story that you have already done. And let's call this a five. Right? It's five story points for that one. Now you estimate every other story you have relative to story A. Is it about the same? Is it about half? Is it twice as difficult? How difficult is it? And the team does this together. And uh, yeah, there's more to it. Uh, and for some reason, they use the Fibonacci numbers here, except for 20. Uh, and I don't really know why, but they use the Fibonacci numbers here as, as, the, as the available sizes, available story points. Right? Uh, <laughs> and they cannot be too big. Uh, So why are we using story points instead of time? It's because time estimates tend to vary much more by person. And time estimates encourages padding, encourages that you add a little bit of buffer in it somehow. Because you kind of feel that, you know, if I'm going to do this, yeah, I think it's probably five hours, but you know, I don't know, let me, let me put in eight, just to be sure, right? And you have padding all over the place, right? That just accumulates, right? And so you don't have, you don't have an, an accurate, based on your understanding, estimate of how, it's gonna, how long it's going to take at all. Uh, so story point estimates tend to be more consistent from person to person. You're not committing to time. You just say this is about how, about as big uh, how big it is, and it's easier to estimate relative size rather than absolute size. Right? So how do you do this? You play planning poker. So each player get sets of gets a set of cards uh, with these numbers from one to to twenty. Uh, the team, this is in the sprint planning, uh, it could be in the sprint planning meeting, it could also be in the kind of uh, backlog refinement meeting or something. Uh, the team discusses the user story with the product, product owner to make sure that everybody understands what it is. Then all players give their estimate of how many story points the story should be at the same time. Uh, if some players are outliers here, like this guy. So that three is a three, a three, a three, a five, a seven. Then after step three here, this guy is going to get asked, why do you think it's a seven? And this guy might say, well, you know, we need to do this and this and that. And that is really tricky to do that. And then somebody else says, well, you know, no, it's not tricky. It's actually pretty easy to do that. We can just do it this way. And the first guy says, oh, I see. 
and then you vote again, you play again. And so essentially what you're doing is that you're using the collective expertise to address, if somebody, if somebody thinks it's simple, it's the same thing. Oh, this is very simple. Okay, explain how it's simple. And then I realize the, other, the other team members may realize that, well, you know, he's missing that thing. You know, he forgot, he forgot that he needed to update the database as well, or whatever it is, right? And, and so you, 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 you're utilizing the, 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 the collective ex expertise in order to get to a better estimate. So, so you continue to do this until you reach a reasonable consensus. Right? And it's, it's always the case, if somebody has an estimate that's way more than the other ones, either this guy knows more or he knows less than the rest of the people. Right? And the conversation is bringing that out. So why do you play panning poker? Where you get multiple expert opinions. Uh, it shows, we, it studies show that it gives more accurate estimates. And also it's kind of fun to do it, as a matter of fact. So now, so we have these story points now. Now the velocity of a team is the, 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 the capacity of the team. is how many story points that this, does this team pull off per sprint? It varies widely in the be in, uh, between sprints in the beginning because you don't know, right? You have very little idea, right? But as, as time goes, you start to get better and better and better at this. Uh, and also, you cannot compare two teams, because in one team they might call one story a five, and the other te might team might call that story an eight. So, so comparing two teams is completely, completely irrelevant. Right? Uh, but what happens is that you can compare against yourself. Right? So. Uh, in this case, so this team, they pulled off 19 story points in iteration to 8 in iteration 3. So they probably took on more than they could do. But eventually, this tends to kind of stabilize. And on top of that, it doesn't even stabilize that way. It actually stabilizes that way because the because the performance of the team improves over time. Once you get to know each other is one thing, but also you become better at doing these estimates. So applications of story points. This is a pretty good saying, actually. Failing to plan is planning to fail. So even though most, a lot of people think that you know, these agile things, you're not planning. It's just a way to avoid the planning but it's not avoiding planning. You're just planning for the near future all the time. Uh, so say that, say that you have a team with, that has a velocity of nine story points. Uh, and you have, it's hard to see here, the a product backlog where the number of story points on these stories is three, three, two, three, two, three, et cetera. Well, if the capacity of the team is nine story points, chances are the team, they can do maybe eight or maybe, say, stretch itself up to 11. But it would be completely idiotic to take on all of that. If you know that's your capacity, that's way above your capacity, right? And you're committing. You're committing to doing it as well, right? This is, you, don't, you don't want to kind of do that to yourself, right? So product owner calls. He says, how much will be done by June 30th? When can we ship this set of features? And what you have as your tools to answer that question is the team velocity and, and the prioritized product backlog. And the number of sprints left is the number of story points remaining in, in total in the product backlog divided by the velocity that you have. Right? So,
you can fairly easily get a pretty good understanding of what you will be able to put, pull off when as a team. And then the product owner can use that as input to decide when they want to release, right? Product owner might say, you know, I want to release, I want to release when I have this set of features. Okay, so it seems like after in two sprints away, we should be able to release that. I mean, you could also kind of have a optimistic or, or, or best case and worst case scenarios of this. So to summarize, there's five levels of planning, going from strategic to tactical, the most tactical being the, the daily scrum meeting. Uh, we looked at user stories and acceptance criteria. And user stories should be independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, and testable, right? I think it's the first time I got all of them. The first, first try, at least. And the three Cs, the card, which is the story itself, the, the, the conversation, which are details about the story, and the uh, uh, collaboration, which is the, uh, the acceptance criteria, when it's done. And then we looked at story points and how they come about. And so I, as I, 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 I ask you, or stress this again, do not compare team to team. It's pointless. Compare against yourself. And this is what helped us at, at DoubleClick in the end about how are we doing as an organization. Well, we didn't know how we were doing in absolute terms. But all we can say is that we are improving. We're doing better and better and better. Uh, and you can use these story points for for, for, for planning, for estimation. And then we talked about the team velocity, which is the capacity of the team per sprint. And that is, that is all I got for you today. Any, uh, any questions about anything? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot for a day. And especially, it's, it's fluffy stuff, right? It's <laughs> not what you're used to. I understand that. I understand that completely. Right? And as Lasse said, uh, uh, he said, you know, you should, uh, in the fir after the first sprint, you should kind of reflect and see how things are going. And you're going to think, you know, this is what a disaster. Right? It's, it's, it's so fluffy. And <laughs> it's awful. Uh, but, but you kind of, once you get the hang of it, you, you start to see that this actually, this is, this is a pretty good way of getting things done. And it's the best way we know, really, right now. I'm not sure it's going to be the last thing, the best thing ever, but it's the only thing that seems to work reasonably well right now. Questions? No? OK. Thank you. Thank you.